we were set up to demand a world-class, um, fully integrated and accessible, publicly owned and accountable public transport network for everybody in our city. So I'm joined here today by loads and loads of our supporters. It's great to see such a great turnout today. Um, and two of the campaign committee members, Brenda and Ruth, who I hope will be able to contribute to the discussion. But before I get started, I just wanted to do a bit of uh, um, participation with you. Um, I was wondering if the committee <laughs> would indulge me in a, put your hands up if you are in a household or live in a household that has access Ms. to Hansen, a car. I'm not sure that that's uh, in entirely appropriate. Uh, I'll allow it one time and we'll see where we go, but that's it. And then you'll need to get on and you're okay. taking time out of your 10 minutes. Could, could you put your hand up if you if you live in a household that has access to a car? So the major, majority of the committee then. So I'm sure you'll be aware that the majority of people who live in Glasgow don't have access to a car. Um, and including most of our campaign members and supporters. For us, public transport is often only the, the only option for getting around. That is why the issues raised by this petition are so important to so many people across our city region who are being failed by the present privatised public transport system. That's why this petition has gained so much support over the last two years, now signed by 10,727 people demanding action from you, our representatives at the council. So I don't want to dwell on it too much, but it has been an incredibly frustrating process for us to even get to the stage where we've been invited to speak to you today. Our petition was handed in originally on the 11th of May 2018, so eight months ago, not the 9th of October as it says in your papers. And our aim when handing it in in May was to kick start a debate on what new powers our city region must be granted in order to sort out the mess that our public transport is in ahead of the Scottish Parliament's <coughs> consultation on the transport bill, which ran last summer. But we were told that the petition wasn't eligible because there was an ongoing consultation on public transport. Meanwhile, that consultation failed to give its feedback by the 31st of August, as had been promised. Meanwhile, the council submitted an extremely weak response to the Scottish Parliament's consultation, which didn't acknowledge or reflect our campaign's demands. And meanwhile, most can discuss the terms of that partnership after this presentation. But the good news is we are, um, we very much welcome much of the Connectivity Commission's first report, which was published by the Council in November 2018. This report clearly articulates that poor public transport, like we have in Glasgow, is a matter of social, environmental and economic injustice, which is exacerbating the huge inequalities in wealth and in health that we have in our city and preventing a third of our population, those dependent on overpriced, poorly planned or non-existent bus routes from properly participating in the city's economy, and it is excluding disabled people altogether, as much of our public transport network is completely inaccessible. Over the last 10 years, millions of miles of bus routes have been cut in Scotland by private bus companies. This list supplied to me by SPT just before Christmas shows more than a thousand route cancellations across Strathclyde since 2009, which have affected many of our campaign's supporters. I got involved in this because the number 42 bus, uh, which I used to use regularly, was cancelled by first in 2015 because it wasn't seen as commercially viable. And both Brenda and Ruth here have been affected by the change of route of the number 4A, which now no longer serves their community at all. And this same story is being repeated time and time again across Scotland as a result of our broken, privatised model. And on top of that, 
Bus fares have skyrocketed 18% in the last five years, according to Transport Scotland statistics. And First Bus put their fares up twice in 2018, so a single now costs £2.40, which is 40% more than the £1.70 it costs in Edinburgh, where they have publicly owned Lothian buses. We don't think that is fair at all. So people are being priced off and ripped off our bus network. And many people are being forced to buy cars that they just simply cannot afford to run, which is pushing them further into debt and causing an environmental disaster. Most of our city's air pollution and carbon emissions come from transport. And transport is the only sector which has actually increased its emissions since the Scottish Parliament passed its Climate Act in 2009. Last October, the, inter the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published a stark warning demanding rapid and far-reaching changes to our transport network over the next 12 years before 2030 in order to prevent climate breakdown. So for Glasgow, that means shifting huge numbers of people out of their cars and onto public transport. And the only way we're going to do this is by hugely improving the service and reducing the fares. So we have to stop seeing public transport as a business which is there to make a profit for private shareholders. We should see public transport as an essential strategic public service which helps us achieve our city's social, environmental and economic goals. In this report, um, here, very well thumbed, uh, building a world-class bus system for network uh, for, for Britain, um, which was published by Transport for Quality of Life in 2016. It shows exactly how and why we can how and why we can achieve this um, through highly regulated bus franchises and through public ownership. This report highlights the stark fact that running our public transport through this broken privatised mo model is costing us, as taxpayers and as passengers, more for the terrible service that we're being given, nearly £300 million a year in public subsidies goes to Scotland's private bus companies. This report shows that cities and towns across Europe are bringing their buses back into public ownership or remunicipalizing them in order to save money and to provide a better service for their citizens, including our city's uh, twin city in France, Marseille. This report shows that if all the buses outside London were remunicipalized and run in the Lothian model as a public operator, £506 million pounds of public money could be saved every year. First, Glasgow are running our buses into the ground, which is also a huge safety concern. Yesterday, Ruth here was at um, the Traffic Commissioner's office in Edinburgh at public inquiry to investigate whether first poor maintenance was the cause of a number of bus crashes that happened before Christmas. We want to see a public transport system for the Strathclyde region, like the system that's um, used in Munich, in the Munich region, which is highlighted in this report, which operates to the principle, one network, one timetable, one ticket, which offers seamless journeys for its citizens to get wherever they need to go. So Munich has a publicly owned and accountable transport authority, which is responsible for planning the region's uh, transport network so that all transport, train, bus, subway work together in harmony. And then they have a separate publicly owned and accountable operator running all of the services. And last year Munich was voted um, the number one most livable city in the world um, in the Monocle magazine survey and it's no surprise that Glasgow wasn't in the list at all. But we can and we should be able to achieve this if we have your support. And this issue is so important that we cannot afford to get it wrong. So I just want to finish up by um, summarizing what we would like you to do. So what we'd like you to do is what we've been asking for all along. And that is for Glasgow City Council 
to get behind the campaign and to involve us in decisions and strategic plans from now on. So firstly, we want you to support an amendment to the transport bill so that, pub so that um, a publicly owned bus company could run both commercial and non-commercial routes. If we don't get that through the parliament, then Glasgow will be denied the opportunity and the chance to build a public bus company like Lothian Buses. And then we are asking you to seize the franchising powers that will be granted in the transport bill so that we can properly plan and regulate our public transport network. Bus partnerships have failed and will continue to fail Glasgow. The Connectivity Commission says that if this current partnership fails to increase patronage by 25%, which is a huge amount, then, and I quote, the powers in the new Scottish, um, Scottish Transport Bill should be deployed to regulate the network. This is what we want the Council to commit to. And just to finish up with a quote from this report, um, no partnership model, no matter how it is framed, can achieve the transformative change that is needed. It cannot enable a local authority to plan and deliver a comprehensive area-wide bus network. It cannot enable a single easy-to-understand fare structure. It cannot allow timetables and services to be coordinated. It cannot guarantee network stability and easy-to-find comprehensive information. And it cannot enable costs of concessionary fare payments to be brought under control. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Harrison. Could I just ask you to turn your microphone off now? Thank you. Uh, and we'll now ask uh, Ms. Christine Francis uh, from the Council to uh, make her response. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, can I just say how great it is to see so many people interested in supporting transport in Glasgow. And I can just assure you that we actually, as officers, we share your passion and support of public transport as a strategic element of, of service in the city and we, we are working as hard as we can towards making Glasgow um, a, a safe and livable city with great public transport. There was a lot in what you said there and what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to concentrate on the things that were in the bulleted in the petition which you um, asked for answers on and I've actually had a chance to look at and prepare for so I'm going to concentrate on those things and just maybe give you some answers on, on the questions that you've put to us. First of all, you asked for a publicly owned bus company for Glasgow, and um, we probably have to put out right away, as you've done yourself, that, that to achieve public ownership will require legislative change, along with a really significant public sector funding commitment. So it's not currently within the powers of Glasgow City Council to deliver that without that legislative change. The Transport Scotland Bill, which is currently going through Parliament, does propose a number of additional powers for local authorities in relation to provision of bus services, and that includes powers in relation to transport authorities delivering services, but only when an adequate service is not being provided by private operators. So those limited powers, as they stand at the moment, wouldn't allow us to run a commercially viable local bus operation. You're absolutely correct in saying that there are further powers proposed regarding local franchising and the establishment of partnerships with bus operators. And we are generally, as a council, we are supportive and we've expressed our support of those uh, measures that are within the bill. And um, two of the priorities which are in the council's strategic plan for 2017 to 22 already are to explore the feasibility of a local bus franchising framework um, to deliver a more connected service across the city and to improve and refine the statutory quality partnership. So the, the council has already made that commitment in the strategic plan. <coughs> Excuse me. We are committed to improving services provided by buses by all means currently within our powers. And within that, with that in mind, we have recently um, started a voluntary bus partnership 
which has been set up with major bus companies operating within the city. We are wanting to work with them collaboratively, the bus operators, the transport authority, other interest agencies and surrounding authorities in the absence of that significant funding investment and regulation. And that's considered, I think, at the moment to be the best immediate solution to address some of the issues highlighted in the petition. So we are already trying within the, with the powers that are, are available to us to start to address the issues that, that the, in that integrated ticketing solution. The technology to deliver the solution is already out there and is in being employed individually by various public transport operators. So passengers can already use some of that technology to pay for bus journeys with credit card. Rail and subway passengers can pay for their travel by, via an electronic purse or mobile phone. And day capping has also been in place on Glasgow's subway for nearly five years now. However, we do accept that it's not fully integrated and we've got a long way to go to working towards that. However, there's a, a number of issues, which, some of which include the, the wide range of private transport operators that are operating within the city, in, in the city and the commercial pressures that they operate under. So uh, we still haven't arrived at that fully integrated um, ticketing system yet, but we will continue to work with SPT and the public transport operators and Transport Scotland um, towards that goal of integrated smart ticketing. You asked for bike hire stations um, across the city with free access for concessionary card holders. Um, as you're aware, we do have a very successful um, bike hire um, <coughs> system within the city. And during uh, the last year, we actually um, re-procured an extension to that existing scheme, which will see the scheme expand to a minimum of 1,000 cycles located at 100 individual locations across the city. Since we launched that scheme in September 17, we've delivered 19 additional hire stations, bringing the total available locations to 63 across the city. Hire locations are being added all the time at a rate of about six a year, with opportunities for more to be added and using external funding sources. And we're exploring those external funding sources to speed up the expansion of the scheme. It is um, a partnership arrangement with our commercial partner, Mixed Bike, to develop the scheme. The commercial partner does bear the cost of the operation, maintenance and expansion of the scheme. And as such, all decisions about the expansions are taken as a, as a joint decision, uh, looking at where we um, have an identified a need for such a scheme and also looking at the commercial viability of that hire station as the, the operator has to be able to sustain that service over time. However, it's a partnership where we try and identify uh, locations which will um, benefit the city as a whole. We would be very supportive of granting access to the scheme for concession card holders, national entitlement card holders. That scheme is operated and funded by Scottish Government through Transport Scotland and operational responsibility for that scheme sits with Transport Scotland and not with local authorities. We would be very happy, though, to facilitate discussions between Transport Scotland and Next Bike to investigate the feasibility of moving forward with a, a concessionary scheme. However, we would have to note at this point that the scheme, as it's operated by a, a, a private firm as a commercial entity, that it would incur costs which Transport Scotland would have to consider. However, we'd be very happy to, try to facilitate discussions about the, the feasibility of that. <coughs> Again, you asked for a publicly owned transport authority for Glasgow with power over the entire network. Um, you mentioned the Connectivity Commission, um, who were asked to, as an independent body to review transport issues affecting the city. And the first report was published in December 18 and dealt with issues under the jurisdiction of the council. The commission has been asked to go away and, and start as a, produce a second report which will deal with issues not wholly within council control and we are envisaging that that will contain recommendation, recommendations regarding the governance arrangements for the provision of transport within the Glasgow area. Again we have to point out that the setting up of a publicly owned transport authority would require a change in legislation. <coughs> and lastly I think you asked for a coordinated long-term vision and investment in the city's transport needs. The current governance arrangements with regard to transport strategy have a very um, hierarchical approach with a national transport strategy set at the top of that hierarchy 
a regional transport strategy developed by the Regional Transport Partnership, which for Glasgow is SPT, and a local transport strategy produced by local authorities. There's a current update ongoing um, by SPT, updating the regional transport strategy. And following on from the initial report from the Connectivity Commission, the Council intends to, to produce a connectivity plan which will update and supersede our previous local transport strategy. That will set out our strategic approach to how people and commodities move into and around our city every day. It will set out a long-term vision and contain strategic actions to ensure Glasgow's connectivity, accessibility, attractiveness, resilience and mobility that they align with our, our world-class city ambitions, which we share with you. The approved strategy will be developed through significant stakeholder and public involvement and will be used to inform future investment priorities. So there will be a Thank you very much, Ms Francis. Do we have questions for the petitioner or for the officer? Councillor Molyneux. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll try and be brief. It's obviously a really huge topic. Um, First, I'd just like to acknowledge the petitioner's persistence. Um, I'm aware of how long it's taken for this petition to be heard. Um, and you, you will be reassured that there is a review of the public petitions process underway. So I hope that um, in future, when we have petitions of this scale, um, that they do have the opportunity to be heard more formally within the council structures a bit more readily. I know, I know um, it's taken a while, but your persistence is, is admirable. And I think your um, your priorities around integration, affordability, accessibility are, are absolutely the um, the vision for public transport that I think we all hold. Uh, certainly, I, I hold, and I believe colleagues would would hold that as well. Um, I'm, I'm also pleased that at various points you mentioned emissions, air pollution, um, and a regional view on things, not just a city view on things, because I think they're also important. Um, I guess we're, we're coming to specific questions. Um, linked to your kind of five asks. Um, on three, four, and five, the responses from the council, um, I'm not saying they're fully in agreement, but there's, there's, there's broad agreement on the sense of we can do something about those things. Um, on points one and two, particularly around um, publicly owned bus company and integrated ticketing, um, that's the area where the response is, well, at the moment, we can't really do that because um, because legislation doesn't allow us to do it. Um, actually, when you, or, or because the, the systems, actually, when you pick into it, um, one of the reasons why we can't do the the integrated ticketing is because we don't have the publicly owned bus company. So I guess if there's if there's one that has the, the major kind of shift, um, it would be, uh, it would be that point of one. I guess in terms of how we take that forward, um, and I know what your, you know, your asks are about supporting an amendment to the bill. Um, at the moment, I understand the bill is just at stage one in the, in the parliament, um, and stage two is the point at which amendments will be, um, will be lodged. Um, now, they have to be lodged by MSPs. Um, so, and I know in your in initial comments you're saying bickering between political parties is letting Glasgow down. The reality of taking this forward is a politician is going to have to put an amendment forward um, into that process at stage two that hopefully will get support from other parties across the parliament. Um, and that is obviously out with the, you know, the gift of, of councillors around this table, although we obviously have relationships with uh, people who sit in the Scottish Parliament. I guess I'm interested in what engagement have you had already at the Scottish Parliament level with that aim, and do you, do you get a sense that there will be amendments coming forward that, that can be supported? And, I'll, and I'll, um, my background on this is, is I brought a, mo a motion to another policy committee of the Council to get the Council to support amendments at stage two of the planning bill. Um, and then one of the responses we got is, well, we couldn't really do that because we didn't, the amendments didn't exist yet. So we, as a council, we couldn't support something that didn't exist. Um, and I guess there's, there's an issue with this here. So we, there, needs to be, there needs to be a process by which an amendment comes forward. And I guess I'm just keen to say, where are you with that? Ms. Harrison. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we have been watching the transport bill very closely since it was launched in June. And 
Uh, it's the Rural Economy and Connectivity Commission at the Parliament who are scrutinising it, and they took evidence between September and November uh, last year. We weren't invited to give evidence, so we went and held a big rally outside the Parliament on the 3rd of October, um, calling specifically for an amendment that would allow us to set up a publicly owned bus company um, for our region. So our intention really was to lobby the committee, the REC committee, um, so that they take into account our views. We also took them one of these. <laughs> Didn't have quite as many signatures. I think we had, one th we had over 10,000 by then. We took that to them on 3rd of October. Um, and we're expecting their report any moment now. It's meant to be the new year, so I think it will be um, January or February. So we're really hoping that they will recommend that amendment, because actually I've got the bill here, and it only requires removing one line, this thing about unmet need. Um, so we keeping our fingers crossed that the, the, the committee themselves will recommend amending that. If they don't, then we're going to have to step up and, you know, that's a st at the stage when it's going to get more party <coughs> political, which we're not <coughs> looking forward to because we see this as, you know, such an important issue that it should transcend um, political divides. And um, so, yeah, we're, we're just watching to, to see what the REC committee have to say um, before we go about looking about whether an amendment they recommend it or we'll have to do that ourselves. Councillor McTernan. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I also want to um, praise you on your persistence in getting here. I don't, I don't think it was ever a, a, a lack of desire for the committee to have you. I think we all know that council processes aren't always as slick and as smooth as they could be. Um, and as my colleagues already said, we're going to be reviewing the the petition process to try and address issues like yourselves where you've done clearly a substantial amount of work and you're representing probably many more views than the 10,727 you've got there. Um, so thank you for coming and thank you for everyone else who's turned up today. Um, yeah, there is obviously the, the strand of things which are currently beyond the council's power. And I guess for me, that's, that's something for us to take away because it's our colleagues for all of us in the different parties. It's our colleagues who are in Holyrood debating this. And so for us to take, you'll be doing your lobbying, but for us to liaise with our colleagues to talk about the issues that you've raised. I think um, the regulation of, of buses in particular um, is so significant. In Glasgow, it's not just about first bus. We've got multiple bus companies, and that adds additional challenges when we're trying to come together. Um, I particularly heard what you were saying about, um, I think it was Munich, where they have one network, one timetable, and one ticket. Um, and I think for a lot of people who are regularly using public transport, or people who might use it more and are needing that nudge to get them onto it, the, the fin not just the financial ease, but the practical ease of uh, things that you, you know that the subway and the train timetables or the train and the bus are kind of connected with each other. So I think, um, whatever, I think, that, as I say, there's something for us to take away to liaise with our colleagues about the transport bill and to pick up on issues around, particularly around regulation of buses um, and buses for, for people, not profit, primarily for the people. Um, I think there's something for us at Glasgow, in the meantime, to be pushing as hard as we can for that integrated ticketing with a daily cap and transferable across the different modes of transport, because that's probably one of the biggest changes we could make, the best changes we could make to public transport in Glasgow. Um, and and I, I suppose I just want to pick up and support your point about equalities as well. I know that from an equalities um, impact assessment that was done for the wellbeing committee, not for the, for the environment committee, for another piece of work, exactly what you said. It's not just that half of people in Glasgow don't have access to a car. It's that they tend to be um, women, older people, people with disabilities, BME communities. They tend to be people who are going to find it be more disadvantaged economically anyway. They tend to be people living in socioeconomic disadvantage. So it's absolutely an equalities issue that we want to get public transport better. And I'm hopeful that the, the Connectivity Commission will pick up on that. Um, so I guess a, as a proposal, um, 
I th there are, because one of your asks is how can you be, or what, certainly what I'm taking from you is how can you be more, or you representing people in Glasgow, um, be more engaged and involved in our work of developing our policies in Glasgow. Um, our policies will definitely be better for having you involved and engaged in a deliberative way, not just in giving kind of petitions and demands, but actually engaged in discussing back and forth. Um, and the Environment Committee um, obviously has the remit for transport um, and, and, and issues like this. And I know that at their last meeting, because I sit on that committee as well, they're looking at developing um, a transport review group. And there's opportunities within that, I, th I would think, to actually not just listen to what you're saying, but actually have some kind of dialogue and deliberative engagement with you around our transport and moving to um, what Ms. Francis was talking about, our new connectivity plan, ensuring that we have genuine engagement, genuine discussion and debate around developing that plan. So I would propose that we ask the Environment Committee to take this on to look at engaging um, with the, the, the Transport Review Working Group, engaging yourselves, representing people in Glasgow to engage with the Transport Review Working Group with a view and the intention, whatever process they, they come up and say, but with the intention of having yourselves representing people engaged in the kind of ongoing policy discussion around this. Councillor Butler. Um, thanks very much, convener. Uh, and can I first of all thank uh, Ellie and her colleagues for coming along and presenting a very detailed uh, and cogent case, uh, all of which I happen to agree with. Um, and I think most people would uh, because uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, the reality is that the uh, buses, uh, public transport is a kind of misnomer. It's a scandal uh, and it is a rip-off and it has been for many, many years since way back in terms of deregulation. Uh, and I do think that uh, I would support the idea of a publicly owned bus company integrated ticketing system, but those are the two areas where there has to be legislative change. You know that, uh, and we know that. And I would say that whatever we can do to push the aims of your petition and the petitioners and your campaign forward in the council, that's fine. And uh, my colleague, Councillor McTiernan, has suggested a way that we, you know, we refer it to another policy committee, we then refer it uh, to the uh, transport review. But um, I'll ask you this question. Uh, I know that you said that uh, you know you tried to get a consensus uh, in the Parliament, and that's a good thing. That can be done on occasion. I know it can be done through personal experience. But uh, it might very well be that even though you achieve that consensus, uh, you will need someone or a few members actually to push the wording at the actual committee. I take it you've got that uh, in hand and that there are people of one party or all parties who are willing to support that at the committee because that's the way to begin to get things done. Agitation, absolutely correct. Public um, petitions, good way, good model forward. But if you want to get legislative change, I do, and this is a question to you, uh, ask you, you have got parliamentarians lined up, haven't you? Please say you have. <laughs>
very promptly at half past two because we're going to Edinburgh to meet Michael Matheson, the, the transport minister. That's, we've been waiting for our meeting for about six months, so we're going to meet him at four o'clock today. And, um, you know, we're going to go with the same demands um, that we brought to you. So f first for the, for the bill to be amended so that we have the option to... Um, have a publicly owned bus company for Glasgow. If that's not amended, you know, we might be waiting another 10 years before there's another transport bill. And also, we're going to demand some funding for... We want to be... We want, as we said, we want you to seize those franchising powers. This report outlines how powerful they can be for transforming a public transport network. That's how you deliver integrated ticketing. It's no use going, oh, we haven't managed to do it. You haven't managed to do it because you need those to utilise those franchising powers to do it. So as soon as those come in with the transport bill, that should be the heart and soul of your transport policies, thinking. And, and in terms of how you reconfigure the city centre, which is happening through the Avenues project at the moment, you need to use the, the, the franchising power so that you're planning the bus routes while you're digging up the streets and reconfiguring how it all looks. Like, it all needs to, to work together. So... We want you to seize those powers, to tell um, Transport Scotland that you want to, to use those powers, um, and we want Glasgow to be the pilot. We want to show how transformative it can be if you use franchising, and we want Transport Scotland to fund it. So there's a similar process happening in Manchester at the moment because um, the Bus Act in England came in in 2017 and that gave powers to um, <coughs> areas where they have mayors like they have a new mayor in Manchester to implement franchising so we're in touch with a campaigner who's doing very similar work in in Manchester to try and get the mayor Andy Burnham to implement those powers and it's all about um, planning the network so that it runs for the so that it works for the people in the city and not for the private the profit um, of the private bus companies and if you look at this report and I've actually got I managed to get a few extra copies um, to leave to leave a couple with you um, the only place in the UK where there's franchising in operation at the moment is London and they uh, under transport for London the profits are capped at two percent Bus companies are not allowed to make more than 2% profit. Elsewhere in the UK, profits are between 6 and 20%. The bus companies are taken out of the system. They're ripping off <laughs> the poorest people in our society. They're taking that money out of the system. And that's why you save so much through public ownership or through franchising, because all of that can be reinvested in expanding and improving the network. Your indulgence, Chair. Please. Ellie, we're, we're in danger of vehemently agreeing with each other here. <laughs> uh, can I say to you that I've always uh, be believed that it is not a private concern, it, is, uh, it should be a public service. Uh, uh, and uh, as a socialist, I've always believed that, so there's no problem there. What I was asking that you, though, was that uh, all the arguments, yes, they, they all point to the common sense objective of doing what your campaign is saying should be done but as you quite rightly say we need legislation in the two areas in terms of integrated ticketing and publicly owned bus companies i, I do uh, accept in london the uh, regulation of the buses and franchising the current stick approach is a good way forward it's you know some steps forward but i want i guess as most of you want or all of you want publicly owned bus companies but we do need the legislative clout to do that. And we, when we get the legislative clout, I don't think we'll hesitate. So I'll come back to my question. Uh, my question is, um, do you have someone, not who is simply sympathetic, which is good, but who is willing to put in uh, model uh, amendments to the bill at the appropriate stage to make these two legislative demands flesh, to make it reality? It's just, a pra it's just a practical point because you've got all the goodwill in the world, but unless you get an MSP or a couple of MSPs or more than that to get their act together and maybe even just produce the wording for them, then it might fail. 
and we wouldn't want that. Yeah, well, stage two of the bill, uh, I think, starts on the 1st of March. So between now and the 1st of March, you know, we're waiting for the REC committee report, we're seeing what they say, and then we're, um, you know, we'll, we'll be working on that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the franchising powers are already in the bill. You know, our issue is the bi with the bill is that it has this option for partnerships instead. You have to choose to utilise the franchising powers. They're in the bill. So that's what we want you to get behind, to see that as the, as the real, um, you know, the, what that could offer to the city um, and not to opt for obviously what the bus companies what, what want you to do is to go with this partnership which means that they get to keep more of the profit for themselves and they've all been um, the, the bus companies have all been at the parliament um, lobbying how we've seen them like when we got to sit at the um, at the committee <coughs> table for one of the the rec committee um, stakeholder events I sat at the table with the head of first the head of McGill's the head of um, stagecoach the head of the Confederation for Passenger Transport um, and the head of Lothian buses as well. And they, 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 actually, they all just operated like a cartel. And had we not been sat at the table, <laughs> then there would have been no passenger voice there at all. So that's why we've come to you to say, you know, these powers are there. We want you to seize them as part of the strategy for, for delivering the world class public transport system that we want. Ms. Harrison, I, I just you're, you're perhaps in danger of you know, given that you're you're going to have to finish up by half two to get away to Edinburgh to see your transport minister. Uh, maybe want to keep quite brief. Uh, I'd ask I, I've got a, a number of people now wishing to come in, uh, and so I'd ask them to be uh, succinct. So I've got Councillor Rhodes, Councillor Kerr, uh, Ms. Lowe, and Councillor Molyneux. Councillor Rhodes. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, it's a question for the officer in relation to the responses that you gave where you made reference to the need for legislative change, whether we don't currently have powers to do things, um, such as the public owned bus company and so on. Um, does the council currently have a position or a view on whether or not it supports those legislative changes? And if not, is it possible for the council to take that view? Um. Council obviously has a, a view and is broadly supportive of all the measures that are in the bill uh, at the moment. So we are supportive of increased um, powers for um, franchising, for um, partnerships, etc. All of those measures we, we are supportive of. Uh, the ones that are not there at the moment, um, I think that's something that we are actually looking to the Connectivity Commission to, to, to flesh out. These are not going to be simple and easy things to do and I think it's something that, that, that needs to, to have a lot more um, of a political leadership. We need to know what, the, what politicians want, want for that and whether they would be broadly supportive of it. So yes, we, have, we are broadly supportive of all the measures in the bill but what I think Ellie is looking for is for the bill to go much further and I think we would be um, looking for political leadership on that one. Councillor Kerr. Uh, thanks very much and I just want to say thanks to everybody who's came along today um, and this meeting it just shows you the petition review that's obviously going on if we can get the petitions working properly this is the type of turnout we can have in meetings like this which is really really good um, I, I just want to say look, I agree with the sentiments of the petition um, I think I've got some disagreements with some of the stuff particularly around like public ownership and stuff like that which I don't expect many people will be surprised about considering the party allegiances that I've got um, but what I wanted to ask is a question more to the officers. Obviously, we've got the transport bill, which is still going to the second stage, so we don't exactly know what's going to be in that yet. We've also got the Connectivity Commission, which has released one report, and I'm, I'm looking to the administration, has still got the second set of that report to come forward. So the question I'm really asking is, if we accepted to send this off to another committee right now, is it not just a bit early to be having this discussion where we don't know exactly what the Connectivity Commission is going to come back with, or the transport bill, or any of these other things? And it might be worthwhile actually taking it to a committee at some stage later on rather than at the current moment because it might be a bit too early because we don't know what's going to happen in these other reports. I think it is unfortunate timing in that we are, we are in this round where we have 
a regional transport strategy which is underway at the moment and won't be finished, I think, for another two years. We have the Connectivity Commission which hasn't completed its deliberations. So yes, I think the timing is unfortunate. Nevertheless, I think the, the bill itself, it, some of these things are so very much it's, it's common sense, I suppose, that we, we would be very supportive of them. But yes, the timing is a little bit unfortunate. Now, I think Ellie made a good point earlier on that if, if we don't get things through, everything that we need in this transport bill, then there might well be a quite considerable time before the next one. So um, I think that having the discussion at this point is, is relevant and, and right that we should have that. And if there is a, a political desire for, for, for us to try and uh, push the bill harder, then we would be happy to, to, to take that advice. We have the uh, convener for environment and sustainability process. Uh, certainly, I'm very open to dialogue and discussion um, on the council. I think um, hopefully we set that tone looking at the non-residential parking levy discussion, whereby that was certainly something that came up um, as, as something that needs legislation. Um, and through the committee process, we were able to find a council position on that. Um, so certainly, if this is something that members have um, a general feeling that we should be discussing further. Um, as Ms Francis says, uh, there does need to be a political decision to be made. And I'm very open to continuing that conversation around how the council may wish to change um, its position on, um, on any particular aspects of the, of the bill as it goes forward. Um, I don't want to commit <laughs> any position here. Um, my opinion is only my opinion. And I think um, the, the democratic process means that it has to be a much uh, more in-depth and, and wider conversation. But as I say, um, I'm open um, and I'm certainly happy to continue the, the discussion wherever that might be appropriate. Thank you. Um, Ms Lowe. Thank you very much, Ellie. I thought your presentation was excellent. And I represent the community councils in Glasgow. Um, I'm chair of Townhead and Ladywell Community Council. And your um, frustration is shared by me because we've, we're currently um, in a, a place where we're trying to find better public transport for our area and for the Drygate area. Um, and we're, we're coming across a very closed door. Um, so um, there are many areas in Glasgow of multiple um, deprivation that depend upon accessible and integrated transport to address the inequalities in Glasgow. Um, I know that as Chair of Townhead and Ladywell Community Council, I give you my full support. <coughs> I'm, I'd like to propose that um, we take your petition to all the community councils at the next Community Council Development Forum um, and, and give it an airing there, and that way we will widen the conversation amongst the general public, if that's, if that's acceptable. I think that that's an eminently sensible suggestion and that will widen out the, the consultation and just the publicity around this issue. I, I think we all individually understand the issue, but I think widening it out and actually, you know, showing people that we, we can make a difference, I think that's important. So thank you for that. Uh, Ms Barry. Hi, um, my name is Lorraine Barry. I represent the Glasgow Equalities Forum and I just wanted to chip in that our members, Glasgow Disability Alliance, have many concerns about accessibility. Um, many of their members may well have signed your petition and particular issues have been around the lack of accessibility in the subway particularly. So we would support um, the, the work that improves accessibility. I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment, but we've heard a, a bit of local and national strategies and um, bills, but the community plan hasn't been mentioned. And the community plan, one of its work streams is transport. Now, we all probably know that the Community Empowerment Act actually <coughs> gives communities the right to be involved in determining legislation from the inception right through to the passing of legislation. Um, and I wonder if, well, certainly in terms of the community plan, we in, the Equality Forum is involved in the resilience strategy and we have been consulted and involved in that, but we don't feel that the community and equality's involvement is quite as it should be in all the five streams. And certainly we don't have a great deal of contact in terms of transport. So one, there should be community voices right embedded in that strategy. And two, is that an avenue you can pursue? And, you know, we shouldn't be having consultation events when there's a group of interested citizens who want to be involved and are engaged in the issue already. I'll just make that suggestion. Mr Anderson's just telling me that uh, 
under community planning, uh, he he'd be able to move that on, uh, you know, to to actually engage with that. So uh, I, I'm not sure that you're clearly going to be pressed for time, Ellie. Um, that's now half past. Uh, I, I'll. Councillor Molyneux did indicate he wanted a, a, another bite of the cherry, so I, and I did indicate that I would allow that. But he will be incredibly brief, I'm sure. You are, you're very kind, Chair. Uh, I will be brief. So the point on amendments that need to come forward at stage two, um, members of this council could bring a motion, either at full council or through policy committee, to support those. But obviously, like I say, we need them to exist. So I think that's something that elected members can bring forward uh, another time. Uh, it was a question, really, for Ms Francis on... Um, whether there are provisions currently in the draft bill, uh, like franchising, that um, petitioners want us to be preparing for to use, at what point would officers normally start preparing for provisions that are coming in new legislation? So have we started doing work on the potential use of franchising? And if not, would we be starting that imminently? Or do we wait until the whole legislation is passed because we don't know whether it's going to pass or, or fall? Um, before we actually start looking seriously at the detail of uh, about how we apply those provisions. It's very difficult at this point in time to progress any, any detail for these things because we don't know at this time what, what the bill is actually going to, to bring forward, what, what powers it's actually going to give us. I think in addition to that, th this would be a major um, shift in the way that, that we do things. It would be a, a really huge piece of work to, to start to look at, at introducing franchising. So it would need considerable resources and considerable time um, spent on it. And to do that, we really have, we'd have to be really sure that of what we could do and what the powers actually were that were given to us and how it could be applied. So rather than waste time and resources on, on preparing something that may be abortive, we, w we would wait and to see what, what the details are of the powers that, are, that come through the transport bill. Thank you very much. Uh, I think with that, I think we should probably conclude. I think what I would say is that the, the, uh, certainly the, s the sense in the room is that you're pushing an a, a open door. There's absolutely no demoral of the, the, what we need as a, an integrated transport system. And, uh, and improvements to, to the, the franchising models. Um, clearly, that there are some issues around the, the, the community councils, and Ms. Lowe has very kindly offered to, to widen out the, the, the petition you've brought, effectively the issues you've brought to uh, our community councils. Uh, Ms. Barry, with uh, Mr. Anderson's help, is going to take that through uh, community planning. Uh, that there is, you know, certainly the, the Environment Sustainability uh, Committee are well cited on this. And, and while I understand there, there w was some potential of perhaps a working party, that's not the case yet, as, as I understand it. Uh, however, that, be, that if that comes to pass, almost certainly that would be a piece of work that they'd be, they'd be asked to do. Uh, I've got Councillor McTernan uh, asking to come in. So just um, as... I guess to, I said, I propose that we actually formally refer it to the Environment Committee. Um, so I guess I'd like to move that as a motion that we formally refer this to the Environment Committee so that that, um, effectively, we want this to be part of our policy discussion. Sure. Um, and with, a very, with, with the, the question of can it then be referred on to the Transport Review? I'll say. She just wanted to add to that and make... Um, uh, I know we can also remit to other organisations and we obviously do already have a publicly owned transport authority, transport authority in the form of SPT um, and they are relevant to a number of these points so my suggestion is we refer it onwards both to the Environment Committee and to SPT. Uh, thanks, Chair. I think given the uh, recent discussions, I think uh, the best place for it would probably be the Connectivity Commission as an independent body um, that's already considering uh, transport needs around the city, probably to, to recommend that to them. I would like to formally move that. I'd like to second that, Chair. Okay. Yeah, can we have that? Miss Law. 
can I just uh, get a, a point of information that by referring it to all these other committees, it doesn't preclude it coming back to this committee? It wouldn't come back to, <coughs> excuse me, to this committee. Uh, if it was going anywhere, it would go on to uh, the city administration committee, or you know, if you like, higher. So it wouldn't necessarily come back to us. Well, then, in that case, um, can we provide some sort of a mechanism for community councils to be kept abreast of where it's at? If we're going to go down the road of engaging with them and um, consulting with them. Uh, I, I am uh, told by the, the officer on my left that if I tell him to do that, it will be so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 uh, with that, I think we should conclude, but uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Harrison. Thank you all those that came with interest. This was a very interesting uh, petition. And thank you for that. <laughs>